Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining our latest productivity talk, organized by the Asian Productivity Organization, or APO, where we feature guests who do interesting work at the nexus of policy, production, and technology in Asia and beyond. This is Paul Chait Cropper Yoon, and I'm with the Digital Programs and Information Unit, as well as the Public Sector Unit of the APO. Over the past decade, we have seen a remarkable story of innovation play out worldwide. The electrification of transport, shown by the rise of Elon Musk, Tesla Motors and their electric cars has become a major global trend and a talking point. However, there are also voices today that suggest that the most transformative technology, the mobility sector, are not these electric cars or autonomous vehicles, but lightweight electric vehicles, which are grouped under the name micromobility. So what exactly is micromobility and why is it so important for the transport sector in Asia Pacific and around the world? To answer this question today, we have Oliver Bruce, co-host of the Micro Mobility Podcast and Conference for Micro Mobility Industries. He has an expertise in micro mobility, mobility as a service, and has experience advising governments and investing in businesses related to transport, as well as climate change mitigation and adaptation tech. Thank you for joining us today, Oliver. You're most welcome. It's lovely to be here. So before we get into it, uh, let's talk a little bit about your background. Uh, how did you come to be interested in micro mobility? Yeah, well, look, um, as you so generously mentioned in your intro, uh, my background is actually in climate uh, climate change. I was I was uh, lucky enough to be a student delegate representative in Copenhagen in uh, in twenty in two thousand and nine, uh, and and there it was really uh, clear to me. It was like we need to be making really big changes in in, uh, in transport, especially uh, working out how to rapidly decarbonize our transport. Um, so I ended up at Uber. Uh, in the Australia, New Zealand, Australasian organization working on uh, mobility as a service and, and uh, trying to help reduce carbon emissions through uh, providing, uh, changing the business model really around cars and saying, hey, if we can get a, a people into lower emissions cars and then over time, uh, hopefully be able to provide a service so that they can give up their cars, um, then maybe we'd be able to drive emissions down. But actually, once I kind of once I left there, I, I was really looking around for things that could really radically reduce the amount of uh, emissions per per kilometer that that people travel. Um, and I was looking around at what vehicles were emerging uh, that could enable that. And that's where uh, myself and my my co-host for the Micro Mobility Podcast, Horace Dedu, really did quite a lot of the uh, work and analysis to really uncover this sort of rapidly growing but completely uh, unrecognized space of electric bikes and scooters. And in that, uh, we pre started producing a podcast and now run the Micromobility Conference as well, which is sort of the premier um, uh, conference on this globally that, uh, that covers electric vehicles that go up to about 500 kilograms. Mm. Uh, great. And I guess uh, the place that it makes most sense to, to start is uh, to explain to everyone what exactly is micromobility and uh, so please, uh, if you want to get into that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, I might just pull up some slides if that's okay with you. And, sure, yeah, um, please, yeah. yeah, excellent. Well, look, um, oh, and, and I, I guess the other point that maybe might just be very useful to provide a little bit of context on is also yes, Horace please. as well, my co-host. So um, yeah, so Horace uh, is w w trained under Clayton Christensen uh, at, at, at um at, at Harvard University, and you may know Clayton because he was the one who came up with the term disruptive innovation. Yeah. Um, and so Horace was a sort of star student uh, back in the 90s when he was writing the book, The Innovator's Dilemma, and then went off to Nokia and really made his name uh, actually as the as the uh, kind of analyst who, when the iPhone came out, he said, look, this is a really big deal. This is a new computing platform, and the smartphone is actually going to be a whole new, it's not just another phone, it's actually a whole new uh, paradigm for computing. Um, and wrote about it in the early days. And um, so he's he comes to this not just with a framework of, uh, you know, hey, what's what's cool in the kind of uh, vehicle space or something. He's coming to this with a really rigorous analysis, um, having also worked gone back to work at Clayton Christensen Institute looking at technology ad adaptation curves so what are the what are the circumstances uh and and kind of conditions that are required for vehicles to be or, or sorry new technologies to be adopted 
and then scaled in society. Uh, and he tracked uh, while he was there as, as a part of a book he was writing about 140 different technologies and, and the kind of conditions that were there for them to be able to get to widespread uh, adoption. So it was from that it was from that place that uh, we both ended up looking at micromobility and, and Horace mm. has identified a number of really interesting criteria uh, for why uh, micromobility uh, comes about. And really, you know, having come from that computing world explains a lot about why we think micromobility is interesting. So the kind of key thing for Horace was that he looked at the drop in costs for GPS, batteries, motors, networks, and smartphones, um, and could see that, you know, what we've had sort of five, 10,000 X return, uh, or, or sort of improvement on some of the early componentry that we were putting into smartphones. Uh, and that the, they call it the peace dividends of the smart of the smartphone wars, uh, the complete competition between Apple and Android, um, to drive down the cost of these via of these, um, these electronics, then finding their ways into vehicles. And so the way that we classify micromobility is that they are vehicles that are electric, uh, they are typically utility. So we're not just talking about recreational vehicles. We're not talking about sort of people going out and buying motorbikes to ride down, you know, go for, for recreational trips on it. No, no, it's it's things where you can do a job um, and they are lightweight. So we, we use the framework of um, anything that's in the sort of sub 500 kilogram category. Now, the reason that we look at that is that you can see here, um, this here is a, a graph of all vehicles sold in France from 2012 to 2015. And it's um, mapped on the on the y-axis by CO2 grams per kilometer uh, and on the x-axis by vehicle mass. Now, what you can see is that there's a really clear uh, correlation between vehicle mass and uh, CO2 emissions for the vehicle. But it really, we don't see vehicles that are under about 1,000 kilograms. In actual fact, there's, and there's almost nothing below 500 kilograms. Uh, and then you have right at the bottom, in the bottom left-hand corner of the graph, you've got walking, cycling, e-bikes, and solar cars, and e-scooters. And what Horace recognized was that there's a space that exists in vehicles um, where with these new technologies and the rapidly dropping cost of them as well, what we can see is that there's, uh, there's a design space for smaller vehicles that can exist on the road that will have the performance uh, of things that we're, you know, that that would be able to solve the job to be done uh, of someone who's who's, uh, you know, maybe looking to have a car. So the scope of micromobility is not just electric bikes and scooters, though. Oftentimes, I think it's categorized as that. Um, it, it goes right through to e-mopeds, to these things, uh, you know, kind of heavier cargo bikes that allow for urban deliveries, for example, um, at scale, and through to these vehicles uh, on the right here called the Nimbus, which I'll talk about uh, a bit um, today, which is about a 400, 400 kilogram, 450 kilogram, um, a three-wheeler uh, in this particular case. So there are four-wheelers as well, new electric vehicles coming out of China that are four wheels um, that are about 500 or so kilograms. Um, yeah, hopefully that explains the, the, the sort of, uh, the, the kind of the framing of, of micromobility. I think the key point yeah. as well a, a, as to why it matters is that, um, we were onto something, I think quite early at Uber and you can see that Uber has kind of become a buzzword for a lot of disruption and all that sort of thing. Um, but what we identified was that if you could provide a service to folks that actually meant reliably, they knew they could get a car. It took, um, it took people away from saying, I have to have a second car. Um, I can't rely on taxis um, to, you know, hey, I know that I, there's always going to be a vehicle available. And there were a couple of reasons for that with Uber as to why that mattered. Um, but the mobility as a service, the ability to be able to like uh, walk about, have a smartphone, use the technology that's in the smartphone to enable access to uh, these vehicles is, I think, really key and important uh, to where we think the world is going in, in our thesis at micromobility. Some of this uh, all fair, but you were mentioning about kind of the idea of technology enabling a kind of unbundling the car. I think yeah. it's like a metaphor about a drill. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So so the job to be done, uh, the thesis of job to be done is, is something that sort of caught uh, Hor uh, Horace and also Clay well, Clayton Christensen came up with it. Uh, but Horace oftentimes talks about it. What is the job to be done of a car? Well, a job to be done of a car is really uh, you pay $30,000 or $40,000 for the optionality of walking out the front of your house and knowing for the 5,000 trips that you're going to take uh, with that car over the life of the ownership, uh, you can walk out the front, have a car, 
and know that you can get somewhere. And it's, you know, you you take uh, the, the, the trade-offs with all of that. You have to pay for insurance, you have to pay for gas, you have to get in, you have to get in traffic and it's all very frustrating. Um, and in actual fact, car ownership, while everybody, you know, loves it for the things that it enables is also a real hassle. And if we could get to a point, you know, ultimately someone buys uh, you know, a dr- built a drill because they want a hole in the wall. That the job to be done is the hole in the wall, uh, not the drill. Um, and so, what Horace and, and Clayton really identified in the disruptive uh, disruptive innovation theory was the need for being able to actually go back and ask the question: What is the job to be done? And the thing that micromobility really does better than anything else uh, in our in our uh, argument is that it enables you to be able to get through a city, especially a highly congested and constrained city, uh, probably quicker than anything else and at a very, very low cost per kilometer. Um, mm. Yes, it's not perfect on a lot of other metrics. You know, you, people will argue an e-bike is is not the same as a car. You're going to you're going to get rained on. You're going to have all these other things. It's like, yes, I completely agree with you. But if you look at the job to be done, which is purely how do you get from one from place a to place b the fastest in a highly congested city oftentimes micromobility is by far the best option that's available great um and since you've started to get into it uh i wonder if we can start talking about uh i think your team has a as a pretty strong thesis about all of the kind of advantages that make micromobility solutions so so disruptive or so transformative so maybe we can get into kind of that that comprehensive package yeah absolutely um so in terms of why it matters um when you really go and look at how uh how trips happen how do people actually travel most trips are short um and and that was a you know a kind of a an interesting thing of that we kind of noted uh when we were when we were doing our initial research into this which is that the trip distribution curve like 50 percent of trips are less than five miles in the US. And in Asia and, and a lot of other countries, it's actually even shorter than that. Um, and yet what we end up doing is taking really, really large cars, uh, vehicles that are really kind of quite over-serving for what we need to do, which is oftentimes we just need to move ourselves uh, three or five kilometers down the road. Um, and we will end up tra- traveling not only ourselves, but 2,000 kilograms of metal around us with three extra seats. Um, and we do that because that is often the only vehicle that's available to us. Um, but the kind of the the impacts of that is that you end up with significant amounts of congestion. And so this here is uh, obviously a picture. I think that one is from uh, Jakarta. Uh, but certainly, if you look at around uh, around Asia, they have some of the most congested cities in the world. Um, and yet, when you really think about it, what we're doing is we're going, uh, we're moving some people from point A to point B. And so when you look at the traditional options that have been available uh, for folks to be able to transport themselves around a city, you have the car, and oftentimes people really like their car because it offers freedom, which is it says, I can get from point A to point B without having kind of uh, additional trips on either end. You can take a bike or you can take a bus. Now, both of those have disadvantages. Where we think micromobility uh, op- has an option is that it offers a new way to be able to uh, do the point-to-point transport, but in a way that you don't end up sweaty if you're on a bike, for example, because electric power can uh, facilitate you to be able to get from one place to another. Um, and it provides that uh, ability to travel in those short trips, The the tr- you know, how most people actually travel most of the time. Um, and so what we can see is that there's a, there's a gap that exists for these vehicles, um, similar to how... Uh, you know, uh, Jam, you know, in your early days of having a smartphone, I'm sure it wasn't as good as, as, as your laptop. Uh, but in your very early days of, a la- you know, uh, it, you ended up, uh, the, the, the smartphone became more and more uh, uh, kind of capable, and you ended up using it more and more and more uh, for your computing tasks relative to your laptop. And what we can yeah. see is that, that we, we think there will be an emergence of vehicles that will be very similar to the smartphone in the world of transport. Um, it will not require you to, it will not be a one size fits all, but they will be additional and new trips uh, that you will be enabled to do in the same way that we are able to do new computing tasks with smartphones that we couldn't do even with laptops. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and maybe um, you're sort of hinting at one of the dimensions here, but uh, APO is a, a productivity focused organization. Um, Maybe you can make explicit kind of what are what are all of the advantages for micromobility vehicles in terms of uh, productivity. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, the first is, is, is kind of very clear to me, which is that it's speed. So if you look at uh, ways to get across a city that's highly congested, uh, an e-scooter or an e-bike, this is um, a study from Barclays that was looking at um, typical speeds across a city in New York. Um, and you can see here that the e-scooter travels at 10 miles per hour. It's significantly faster than anything else that's available. Uh, an e-bike is 15 miles an hour. So, uh, and, and also as well, at a very low level of cost. Uh, I should point that out. So what you end up with is by far the better, you know, the best um, option for being able to uh, unlock productivity is really just reducing the amount of travel time or unproductive time that a, that a person would spend during a day. Um, but also not having that hit their wallet, wallet really hard, uh, that they're able to do that at a low cost. The second is really around infrastructure cost as well. So uh, this is from something called the Mobility Disruption Framework from uh, a venture capitalist called Olaf Sackers. Um, and he he went through and ranked the what they called the throughput construction cost of various transportation infrastructure. So one of the things that we oftentimes see, and we certainly I, I live in New Zealand, we have this conversation happening at the moment, uh, is around things like light rail uh, or subways and installing light rails and subways in, in our transport system. And they work really well for throughput capacity in the sense of they can move a lot of kilo a lot of people per kilometer uh, and per hour once they're built. But they are incredibly expensive to build and they really only work in certain areas. Um, what you can see here is that uh, micromobility, the, the infrastructure cost of micromobility is incredibly low. And yet it also allows for really high levels of throughput. Um, so from a, from a cost perspective, it really p pays to go and build infrastructure that, is, uh, that has a really high ROI if you can. Um, so obviously bus rapid transit, micromobility and pedestrian uh, show to be that have the, the, the kind of the, um, the best scores here in terms of what you'd call uh, TCC. Um, so, uh, you know, versus, for example, a mixed traffic uh, road for example, that 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 has uh, not a very high level of throughput and quite a high cost of construction. Hmm. And I'm happy to continue on into transport costs yeah, as well, if you'd like. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so the um, you know, the, the other one that's that's obviously as I alluded to was transport costs. Now, this this here is from Stats New Zealand. It's um, referring to New Zealand, but it is the case in most countries around the world, which is transport is the third largest trans is the third largest living cost uh, in terms of household expenditure. So incredibly sensitive to fuel prices, for example. Uh, and uh, as we can see, which is what's happened during the Ukraine uh, crisis here, uh, the price of oil has gone through the roof. And so being able to provide alternative options uh, for uh, uh, folks to be able to ensure that we, uh, one, can move around the city in a way that's effective uh, and resilient to uh, oil or, or fuel supply shocks, but also being able to do it in a way that um, hits the, hits the you know, like uh, impacts them on the bottom line and a household expenditure is uh, incredibly important, I think. Um, and that really comes about just because the, the, the energy consumption uh, per kilometer is really low. And now Horace uh, has developed something called the, the uh, he calls it the modicum of transport or the, what is the, what is the unit that is required in order to be able to move a human being through a, an urban environment uh, on, a, on, a per kilometer, on a per kilometer basis uh, per passenger. Um, so you can see an electric kick scooter and e-bike score incredibly well on that on that uh, metric, and you can see the the Nimbus or the ePod, which we'll talk about again uh, in the, in a little while. Um, that's a uh, that also scores is about one third the energy intensity of of moving a Tesla uh, Model Three through a city as well, versus something like a Cadillac uh, CTSV, which is a very large uh, kind of uh, uh, internal combustion car as well. So the benefits really exist in terms of being able to reduce energy consumption for each kilometer traveled uh, of the of, of a population. And that flows through into things like emissions. So, you know, 25 percent of trips, 25 um, percent uh, of kilometers traveled um, uh, are responsible. Sorry, the emissions uh, that are generated uh, on trips that are less than five miles is about 25 percent of all emissions and uh, about 50 percent of all trips emissions come under trips that are about 12.5 miles long or something like that. So we can see that there are, are really significant benefits uh, that will come from being able to effectively put, you know, on small trips, use small vehicles and on big trips, use, uh, you know, big vehicles. Um, and, and just being able to mate 
uh, the 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 um, the user demand or the, the how people actually want to use uh, and travel uh, with the appropriate vehicle, we think is uh, one that would really unlock a lot of uh, efficiencies and productivity benefits uh, for a lot of countries that that are looking to be able to move forward. Um, I, I, yeah, so I'd love to get uh, maybe to give people a more uh, visceral sense of what the world would look like if micromobility kind of dominates uh, the transport system. Because uh, as so far as you've been talking about it now, it seems like it's generally a solution just for mostly urban environments where things are kind of densely packed, you get the worst kind of congestion. Um, there's a kind of relationship between what a city looks like and what the kind of means to get around is. So yes. I think we had a conversation uh, uh, before recording about, you know, how much of a city is is basically just parking lots or places for people <laughs> to park their cars. And of course, you also have things like uh, the cul-de-sac uh, suburbs. Yes, uh, the exactly. connection between you know the, these outer laying areas and and kind of the main city. So what, so uh, in a world with micro mobility, these these scooters, these kind of things like the Nimbus, uh, w what does the city look like? Yeah, um, well, look, I'm just going to see if I can pull up an appropriate slide uh, to sure. uh, be able to talk to this. But effectively, um, what, what you end up with is in a city where, which is highly, uh, which is highly uh, car dependent, uh, which is, you know, a lot of the Australian, New Zealand, uh, or what, what you'd call countries that were built up post World War II um, and uh, aren't uh, these sort of Asian mega cities. So, um, what, what you can kind of, the suburban or, or suburb driven development. Um, so countries like, uh, as I mentioned, the U S, uh, uh, some areas of Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand, et cetera, um, had built a very, uh, kind of sprawly, uh, urban form. And the impact of that is that you end up with, with, uh, cities that are re really spread out and, you know, they don't have, uh, agglomeration benefits within the cities. Um, where micromobility offers something really interesting and really valuable is that, uh, oftentimes in the more dense cities, they really have built, they have been built around very fixed subway lines or very fixed transportation transportation options. Um, and that can not always work to their benefit. So for example, um, you, you've seen in New York City, for example, um, Manhattan is incredibly well serviced by transit lines. Uh, but for example, Brooklyn has only two or three transit lines that run through them and they don't have cross transit lines. Uh, so there's, there's uh, what they call a, a real issue with transport poverty or transport deserts um, that, that are very common. Uh, and, and it comes about through kind of a lack of planning. Uh, in, when you're building out when you're building out cities, but we can see that happening in a lot of countries around the world. That there's uh, challenges, especially in the very fast-growing metropolises in Asia. Um, that there's um, you know intention to put in transport lines, but oftentimes they can take a very long time to build. Um, they are challenging to to they're kind of being retrofitted into a city as it's uh, kind of already exploding in growth. Um, and so you do end up with these transport deserts or these challenges of these places that you cannot you know, that the transport from one place to another in the city to another requires going through a central hub that's kind of quite far out from where you'd want it to be. Um, and so an option like a, like micromobility, which can move through the city quickly uh, and is uh, pleasant, hopefully, uh, is an option that we think uh, just from purely from a geometric perspective, you know, the, the size of a micromobility vehicle is typically one to two square meters on the side, on the road versus a car, which is about 10 square meters. So you just have the ability to, to slip through uh, these congested areas and be able to get from one place in the city to another. And we think that that will unlock real productivity benefits for a whole range of people, uh, including access to jobs or um, uh, in terms of being able to remap, for example, things like uh, uh, the rental or, or housing markets, um, which at the moment are in, uh, oftentimes very agglomerated. Uh, you know, high, high, there's a very high price that's paid for, for apartments or housing that's very near big transport lines. And that's due to access to jobs. Uh, the micromobility has an option to, to actually like remap some of that out. Um, that if you can get from one side of the city to the other uh, without having to rely on public transport and you can slip through in a way that doesn't have you kind of impacted by congestion, then you oftentimes are able to have access 
uh, kind of new and exciting uh, employment opportunities that we think are really beneficial. Um, in terms of what works, uh, the kind of the enablers for micromobility, obviously the big one is around transit-oriented development. We do still think that micromobility is a, sorry, that uh, traditional public transport has a very important role to play. And that's oftentimes because being able to travel long distances, um, especially, uh, you know, to to other areas that are agglomerated, where there is agglomerated benefits. Um, so for example, being close to a transport station and then being able to go down the road to uh, something that you might want to be able to uh, to enjoy the city or to be able to get to a job, that can still be really beneficial. Um, and it means that people would say, I don't feel the need to necessarily own a car uh, because I can kind of accent that uh, by owning these other small vehicles that can allow me to better explore the area that I'm in. Um, the next one is really infrastructure. So building electric, bi you know, uh, bike lanes uh, or, or lanes that enable these smaller vehicles to be ridden safely and not have to fight for their space on the road. Um, anybody who's ridden a, an e-bike or, or a scooter, uh, especially in kind of very congested areas, can can really attest to the challenges of, um, uh, uh, you know, just you're fighting against something that's uh, 20 times your weight. Uh, so you really want to be able to have a protected area so that f people feel safe. And the way that that's typically measured is, is the infrastructure enabling someone from the ages of eight to 80 to feel safe to be able to ride uh, their vehicle uh, through a, a kind of a, a town or a city um, in a way that is really, be, you know, makes them feel safe and, and, and enabled. Uh, and then the temperate climate um, matters more for the open air and the low cost versions, for example, uh, e-bikes and e-scooters. Um, and, and there are options uh, very similar to the Nimbus and actually, uh, Paul, do you mind if I just show that video of the of the Nimbus? Would that be a good time I, to, I think to show it now? now? So you can see here, this is a vehicle that's in development at the moment. Uh, and it, it's uh, developed by an American company, but uh, looking for manufacturing partners in Asia, actually, um, who are building an enclosed three-wheeler. Um, the kind of key in innovation that they've managed to do here uh, is that they've got a tilt uh, a tilting mechanism uh, that allows the vehicle to uh, have a small footprint at the front. So it has a, it's only 80 centimeters or uh, between 80 and 90 centimeters wide. Um, it seats one person with a tandem uh, secondary seat in the back for folks who, who do, who might want to be able to do it uh, to, you know, set a small child or take their groceries or whatever. Uh, but it's enclosed. And uh, the price point for this is sort of, you know, 6,000 US dollars, which six to seven thousand us dollars which which for a lot of um uh operate you know a lot of cities around the world will actually be a quite cost effective uh, uh vehicle for a lot of people to be able to purchase it's not a car and it is um but it would work with a highly congested environment and at the same time be able to insulate you against things like temperate climates so, uh, so, you know if you don't have a temperate climate uh, if you are in a really hot space and you need air conditioning or you're in a really cold space and you and you want to have cover from from the rain and the snow etc so i guess what i'm wondering now is with things like the nimbus because um kind of day-to-day -day, the sort of micro mobility things i've seen kind of on the streets in, in tokyo or in bangkok are yeah they tend to be uh based around kind of ride sharing where you open up an app and then you can kind of temporarily use a scooter or an electric bike or something like that. Uh, with the Nimbus, would they operate under that same model? Is it is it more like a car in the sense that people own would own one? Yeah, that's a great uh, yeah. question. Um, we we can see. So Nimbus is not the only company working on on uh, on these three wheelers. Uh, there are a couple of other companies that that I can point to as well. Uh, uh, Akimoto being kind of one of the one of the biggest operators in the states. They're, they're building one. It doesn't tilt uh, at the moment, but it's it's still a it's still a three wheeler, and it has some level of enclosure to it as well. Um, but the you know the the key thing that I think we're going to see from these is that the the price point. I mean, if you, if if Nimbus is able to hit a six thousand dollar price point as they intend and as they they've done the bill of materials, all of the things that are uh, that would be required to be able to build a vehicle like that. Uh, would make sense to to be able to have a price point like that. Um, then, yeah, you you know the biggest people who we have seen who are interested in these are, for example, the food delivery companies who want to be able to provide 
uh, a way for their um, their employers or their their workers to be able to get around a city uh, in a way that uh, keeps them protected and allows them to um, be able to move. Um, and then I imagine there will be, you know, the other largest is is a group that we know are very interested in this are the shared micromobility providers. So, uh, you know, the Beams, the Limes, the the Birds, the the other companies that are um, very interested in this space. Mm. Um, and, and that's because for them, uh, you know, uh, they would be able to put one of those vehicles on at about one, th- you know, so a standard scooter is about, uh, you know, $600, $700. You could put that on and, and earn significantly more than you would on a standard scooter. Um, and uh, certainly from a car share perspective, you, you, you know, if you're competing with a car share company, uh, you, you've got a vehicle now that allows you to really um, become kind of integral, well, sorry, uh, you're competing with a car share company uh, with a vehicle that really has just a very different benefit um, that, that uh, you know, a, st- a standard person wouldn't be able to access with the car share. So we do think that shared is going to be a very important part of how these sort of vehicles end up being used. And the interesting and kind of really beneficial fact about that is that for every single uh, kind of single sh- uh, shared car that goes on the road, typically you take anywhere from like six to 10 cars off the road in terms of the, the vehicles that you would otherwise have. Again, it goes back to the uh, what we talked about in the beginning. The job to be done of a car is to sit out the front of my sit out the front of my house so that I, when I walk outside, I can get one when I need one. Um, and if you have a low enough price point that we can see that's coming with these vehicles and micro mobility, uh, then there should be a low enough cost uh, price point that you should there should be enough of them available that you will always be able to find uh, either a scooter or, or or a vehicle like this when you need it. Um, even in the more kind of dispersed areas uh, and sprawly areas, not like right in a downtown where there's, you know, natural and easy agglomeration of uh, lots of people and the ability to be able to build a service like that. Um, yeah. Right. And so you've talked about enablers. Uh, are there are there things that make it difficult uh, for micro mobility to work? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, natural one is the weather. Uh, and and yeah. this is... Um, you know, I, certainly the, the the Nordic countries have, have managed to get through this just by, with a cultural change. I think that might be slightly more challenging in, in, in really hot temperate, cli- uh, like uh, uh, really hot climates. Um, but I do think that there are vehicles similar to the Vimo or, uh, again, the Nimbus that are coming that will have air conditioning and the ability to be able to um, uh, provide a climate controlled environment. Um Certainly, the economics of uh, shared services in the past have not have not been particularly beneficial, uh, or, or sorry, have been a barrier. Uh, things like share, uh, theft and vandalism and lifespan, etc. Um, I, I I do want to point out that those early days are really over. Like all of the operators these days that are operating, um, if they've made it through and survived, uh, now really have solutions to all of those. And and what you're seeing is these companies are uh, starting to become. Uh, certainly uh, break even if not profitable and in, in building quite uh, quite wonderful little businesses uh, in that in that space. Um, the other one as well is that the barriers uh, that micro mobility really exists in a in a weird uh, space which is we have dedicated infrastructure for cars, we have parking for cars, we have all of the, um, the you know the benefit of a hundred years of having this technology, uh, these technologies being able to move ourselves around cities with these vehicles, um, and and you into it, we are infusing into this habitat, if you if you call it that, uh, these new vehicles that have um, kind of different characteristics. You you can't uh, the the sort of natural one for people is to say, oh, look, I want to ride uh, my scooter and I want to park it wherever I want. Uh, and in and, and actual fact, there's a long and history of this uh, when new city new vehicles get introduced to cities. Um, uh, you know, we're too old, we're too young to now remember it. Uh, but the, there was actually really big problems with parking when cars arrived, which is why we now have parking and parking enforcement and parking garages and all of those things only emerged after the uh, after the car had come along. And we can see similar emergences of uh, parking infrastructure and, uh, and, and new ways of storing uh, and making it sort of socially acceptable, but also providing the space uh, for these vehicles to be stored appropriately. Uh, within a city context as well. Uh, and the final one is really safety. And that's, you know, the, the challenge that we have is that these oftentimes these vehicles are two wheels um, and that two wheels, you know, they can be dangerous. They are statistically more dangerous than, for example, a car that is able to offer more protection. Um, so 
there are a lot of technologies that are coming uh, in terms of uh, ways that you can have the two-wheeler uh, be able to self-balance, a lot of computer vision uh, or new ways of being able to control the vehicle so that you can infuse that computation into the vehicle and, and, and improve the safety. Um, one of the big things that we're going to be presenting on in micromobility, we, we are having companies present on at micromobility uh, in Europe and in the States is, has been computer vision. So being able to identify an obstacle in front of it and have the scooter or the vehicle stop uh, before uh, it hits anything. Um, and all of that innovation happens in micromobility faster than it does in, in standard cars or standard automobiles, uh, just because the, the, the life cycle of the, of the vehicles and the time to development is a lot, a lot faster than what we have in the automobile space as well. So I'm very confident that we will make uh, that when combined with good quality infrastructure, um, the safety the safety specs uh, and and experience uh, of these new vehicles actually substantially better uh, than than other options uh, in time. But it will take a little bit of time. Right. Uh, so thanks for thanks for touching on those points. Um, it does remind me uh, when we were talking about kind of unbundling or the job to do for a car. At least in I know from. Uh, living and growing up in, in Bangkok, one of the uh, parts of the car or job of a car is actually to provide air conditioning. Basically. Yes. It's, yeah. it's as much of a, it's as much of an, an atmosphere or environment control service as it is a transport service. Oh, totally. Uh, so, yeah. So yeah. It, it's, it's interesting to touch on that uh, and how certain kinds of micromobility vehicles are, are kind of better positioned to deal with that issue. Um, yeah. One thing I, that you didn't mention that, but I think you would have a lot to say about is uh, the role of um, regulation or licensing as a as either an enabler or a kind of constraint. So yeah, obviously, absolutely. yeah, I'm thinking, you know, a car, there's a whole traditional licensing system. It's very developed. People kind of have a very clear understanding of, you know, what you can do, who can drive a car, who can't drive a car. Um, but these sort of ride sharing uh services, these scooters, it, there's a kind of, I don't know, regulatory gray space. Is it like a motorcycle? Is it not? So maybe you could comment on that. Yeah. So this is, this is a great question. And one that I know that the Society of Automotive Engineers, uh, SAE, have been uh, working on quite closely. And we, we actually contributed to their early research in 2019 about this. Um, in, in terms of defining what is micromobility, how do they define it? What is, the, uh, what is going to be the licensing and import requirements as well? Um, and so I do, I do think that there is, uh, you know, what we have with this combination of new technologies that, you know, the combination of batteries and motors and everything is that there is a kind of Cambrian explosion is the term that I like to use of um, these new vehicles that are going to emerge. And it will be completely new vehicle types that we haven't ever seen before, um, just because they are enabled uh, in a way that... Uh, not only from the vehicle, uh, but actually from the, if you go back even further, it's in terms of things like manufacturing. Um, being able to build a small, low-cost run of things when you're using modular components is far easier to do than it has been, for example, than to get a, uh, to go out and effectively design a car um, and build a production, like a, a production run of a vehicle, knowing that you have to stamp the steel and make the engines and uh, build, build, you know, build a large company around that, including being able to provide uh, servicing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all of that is uh, we are we are facing right now with the with the, the, the emergence of these new vehicle types. So, um, you know, I think there's very valid questions from governments who are looking at the space, going, "Hey, you know, what's the power cutoff at which we say you don't need a license or you do need a license?" Um, the standard has been from the Europe and, and uh, from Europe and from the US has been it's anywhere from 200 to 750. 250 to 750 watts of power on the vehicle. Um, but there is also these other kind of emergent spaces and the Nimbus and the Arca motor are examples of this where you have a kind of weird regulatory gray area. Now the Nimbus is a very interesting vehicle and one of the reasons I like it so much is um, there is a weird auto classification called an auto cycle. Now an auto cycle was originally developed by the Italians for something called the Piaggio Ape uh, back, in the, back in the 40s and 50s. Uh, which is a three-wheeled uh, kind of uh, truck uh, that would go through the streets of Rome. Uh, and Piaggio had developed it for these small streets in Rome. Uh, and, it, and because of the fact that the Italians are so kind of central to car making along with the French and developed the, uh, the, the auto classification system, the auto cycle is now a kind of recognized standard in most countries around the world. So something like a Nimbus is able to be developed and built 
uh, it sits in this uh, already defined uh, category that just has had no vehicles developed in it. But all of a sudden, because you now are able to build and, and uh, kind of produce vehicles in a way that's very capital efficient relative to other um, previous examples of, of, you know, having to develop it with um, internal combustion engines and develop, um, you know, with the kind of the new additive technologies, additive uh, manufacturing technologies that we can do today. Um, what you're seeing is that uh, there is new vehicles that are popping up and I think are going to be new hits that we never would have seen before uh, or couldn't have seen before. Um, I do think it also, uh, you know, specifically to your point around licensing, uh, we are going to see a very interesting development as well because it's going to be uh, oftentimes these vehicles are not regulated or not registerable when they come into a country. And, and so we do know that there are new vehicles that are coming uh, that are oftentimes not registered but would be con considered incredibly dangerous. And, and that also... Uh, I think is just part of the teething pains and the problems and the challenges that we're going to see as this uh, space grows very quickly. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, and I think, you, you, again, you're starting to segue onto another topic that I think is very interesting. Um, so there's there's a kind of interesting opportunity available for, for certain Asian Pacific countries that are kind of have a expertise in kind of manufacturing, uh, but maybe not not to the standard of manufacturing kind of full vehicles, full cars, which is kind of like a very kind of uh, advanced sort of uh, manufacturing, especially as cars kind of approach the, the level of like, they're almost as complicated as computers now. Yeah, uh, yeah, completely. So uh, yeah, maybe you could touch on on that opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. So so one thing that I've re we both Horace and I have really noted in the development of the space has been uh, that uh, countries that traditionally wouldn't have been in auto manufacturing or you know auto manufacturing is a very it's a very particular game uh, there are only a certain number of countries around the world that actually even now still maintain auto manufacturing capabilities um, and the reason for that is that they're incredibly capital intensive um, that they that they oftentimes require quite involved government support uh, so the countries that you can see that are manufacturing vehicles around the world uh, uh, you know, is China. Um, there is one that's now being supported, and you know, there's been the development of it, Indian uh, car manufacturers um, and and Malaysia, uh, and there are it's a small amount in Indonesia. But for example, um, you know, a lot of smaller states would not be able to get into uh, vehicle manufacturing without really substantial government support, and oftentimes governments just don't have that um, capability. Um, what we have seen is that. Um, the emergence of these smaller vehicles has enabled really uh, countries that traditionally haven't been in the space to be able to get into uh, manufacturing of vehicles. And so some examples that I can give you are India uh, in particular areas, which I'll, which I'll get into in a second, uh, or Taiwan. Uh, th in Europe, it would be Estonia or uh, Portugal, which again, some, some of them had traditionally had um, some level of vehicle manufacturing, but not much. Um, and then uh, other places around the world as well. So we can we can see um, that there is a new with these with kind of the if you if you have any sort of levels of supply chain capabilities in the smartphone space or electronic space, being able to say, hey, we can pivot into this and be able to build new vehicles um, is, I think, a really interesting opportunity. And I want to point out very specifically the one from Ola. So Ola is a is, a, is similar to a Grab or, a, or an Uber. Um, it's a, it, it started out as a rideshare company, um, but it decided uh, about three years ago it was going to get into micromobility. Um, and so it took a small position in a shared operator, and then they came out of it and said, actually, you know what? Um, the biggest opportunity here is for us to become the manufacturer of the next generation of vehicle for India. Um, and so they went from a kind of a, a nothing to being building the world's largest or one of the world's largest electric moped manufacturing sites in Bangalore, uh, which does about will do about 10 million units a year uh, in about three years. So that that's a really uh, interesting leapfrog, in my perspective, uh, of being able to get into vehicle manufacturing in a way, um, you know, India has a long history of, of, uh, of trying to get into uh, interesting uh, automotive uh, experiments. I always loved the Tata Nano. It was an amazing car. I wish, I wish it had been more of a success. But we can see that actually vehicles like this, when you have a really low cost uh, of acquisition in the sense of you know, these will sell for about 1,500 US dollars or so, um, but they, the marginal cost per kilometer for the folks who buy it will be incredibly low. Um, the, the, we, 
we've done calculations and we think it's sort of in the region of sort of anywhere from 10 to 20 cents per kilometer, um, which is an order of magnitude lower than uh, car ownership when you take into account all of the costs. So we can see that there's going to be a huge number of people. Uh, when you look at like where the population growth is going to happen in the world over the next 20 to 30 years, most of the world is going to be going, uh, most of that growth is going to come from Asia or Asia Minor, um, and that that, that end, will end up with uh, a lot of those folks saying, we want to be able to get mobilized. We don't want to have to rely only on public transport for our own new transport costs. We don't want to get a car because a car is actually really frustrating. Or, um, But we are in an urban environment, and so it makes sense for us to be able to get access to a vehicle. And a lot of those folks will turn to a shared service. They will be able to access that vehicle when they need it, or they will purchase it and be able to get it, such as this in India um, from Ola. Um, and the second is, uh, you know, as I mentioned, Nimbus, um, as I, uh, so a couple of things about it, it'll have a 120 kilometer range. It will have a swappable battery system, similar to Gogoro. Um, we'll have a 80 to hundred kilometer an hour top speed. So it's able to be conformable to the existing infrastructure, um, but with a very, very small footprint. So two square meters versus 10. Uh, it has airbags, it has basic ADAS, um, and it's enclosed from the weather. And, and the thing that's really interesting is that they reckon that they will be able to get to production for about 30 to $40 million now. A traditional car, when you go and try and get it to, to production, uh, you're looking at sort of upwards of half a billion dollars uh, to be able to go from sort of, hey, we've developed this concept through, we've built a factory and we're able to start producing these things. The genius and the wonder of micromobility, we think, is that you can get a vehicle uh, out into market for 30 to $40 million. The Arkimoto is another one uh, up in the US that was done in the US with US kind of uh, cost points. And they still managed to get to production uh, for about 45 to $50 million US. Um, so we, we, we just sort of note that from a productivity perspective, um, it's a really, really cool and, and kind of uh, oftentimes uh, uh, like, um, underrepresented and uh, misunderstood space that, that, that there is a uh, a lot of people who uh, would look at this and say oh look these are toys um, they're not very interesting and I, I just want to go back to one slide that I have earlier in my presentation because I, I want to just sh show you that the sort of the scale of what we're talking about here um, if you look at just e-bike sales in in Europe um, we uh, uh, compare it to for example an electric car now the the you know, electric cars, as uh, Paul Chait kind of uh, referenced in, in his introduction, get all of the attention. And I love Elon Musk. I do. I, I think he's wonderful. I think he's doing great things for the planet. But the scale of what the electric cars are actually doing pales in comparison to what, what, what we're seeing from our e-bike manufacturers and our entrepreneurs who are building in that space. And that's in Europe. And you can see the same thing happening in New Zealand. And it is in a lot of cases around the world as well. Actually, e-bike sales, specifically e-bikes, and this is not even mopeds or other, other kind of other emergent uh, vehicle types. Um, those uh, e-bikes outsold uh, electric cars in the US last year. Uh, and, and actually have a faster rate of growth uh, than electric cars too. So we can see, uh, you know, this this opportunity that exists uh, for for folks who want to get into it. It is a non-traditional manufacturing path because oftentimes, uh, especially with, with, with countries in terms of their development, uh, folks will say, look, you have to get into uh, auto manufacturing. There's a lot of other things that will develop around that ecosystem. We make the argument that actually electric, uh, these electric vehicles that exist like this uh, are a really interesting uh, alternative means of being able to develop um, very productive and healthy ecosystems with high potential for growth as well. So uh, it seems like from kind of looking at these trends that uh, micromobility as a technology is very promising. Uh, one, one thing that we haven't touched on directly is kind of the role of, and you mentioned the Tata, uh, the Tata Nano. Yeah. So, which is a really interesting example because um, at least the story of why it failed is they produced a car that was so cheap that people saw it as cheap. So instead yeah. of something, big, oh, wow, it's this thing, like there's a job it can do and it's affordable. It was seen as kind of low status. And yep. of course, you know, you, you look at a car commercial today playing at the Super Bowl or something like that. There's a lot of status attached to what kind of vehicle you own. So I'm wondering how people in the micromobility industry or you specifically have thought about these kind of more cultural questions and cultural fit and how and how micromobility will kind of affect those sorts of preconceptions. Yeah, that's a really great question. And 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 um, 
uh, one that certainly I, as, uh, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> a man in New Zealand, uh, I, you know, I have, I have a particular view of what people are going to be interested in. Uh, but I, uh, you know, again, these vehicles need to sell and that's, that's how they will, uh, that's how they'll succeed is not, is not because I think they're a good idea, but because people actually want them and we can't force them on people. Um, Certainly, you know, those those electric uh, bike sales, I think, are, are relevant. And that works in places like uh, Europe, where there's a lot of consciousness around things like climate change. And, and uh, uh, you know, Europe is one, uh, New Zealand is another. Um, but in other countries where, for example, that isn't so front of mind, I certainly think that just the congestion, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's going to be a lot of it, which is just basic utility. Um, and we, we certainly see it in China, which is that there's a, there's actually this, this whole class of vehicles called the, the neighborhood electric vehicle. Um, and they're typically very low ends. You're talking sort of a thousand to two thousand five hundred dollar price points. Um, there's a there's a whole uh, so there's a whole uh, range of them that have emerged. They only go to 50 kilometers an hour, and they don't require driver's licenses, um, and they only have a range of about 50 kilometers. So there's an we actually don't know the size of the industry uh, because they're not tracked, uh, uh, but they're certainly considered low status, and that's one of the things that I think we will see is that a lot of micro mobility will start off as low status. I do think, however that the performance that we're seeing that we're seeing out of these vehicles um in the sense of you know why do people buy teslas i ha i actually own a tesla and the reason i own it is because it's fast i don't own it because i mean there's there's something in it about you know oh it's good for the environment mainly i own it because it goes zero to 103 seconds and it's mm. very cool and um i, I can see that there are going to be vehicles that emerge in the space that are just going to outperform anything that you can see uh, that you can buy uh, in the traditional vehicle space. Um, certainly something like a Nimbus uh, or an Arkimoto, I think, um, get very interesting. The, the Nimbus especially so. If you can turn up, you uh, you know, you know, just imagine it. You're, you're in Manila. Um, you need to get from one side of town to the other. Your options are you go and uh, catch a bus uh, or you take, you take an Uber. Um, you're stuck in traffic the entire time. Uh, or you get uh, access to, you can walk up to uh, something like a Nimbus. Uh, you hop into it. It's air-conditioned. You you um you rent it for five six dollars an hour equivalent. Uh, zoom across the city, be able to get to your meeting on time, um, and you turn up completely. Uh, you know, with with uh, an air conditioned pod. Um, I can just see that that will shift the, the 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 discussion around status, especially if you're competing against uh you know someone who uh might have ended up. Uh, coming in a, in the back of a, a BMW 7 Series, uh, they, they turn up there, but they're there three hours later, you know, because you, you're able to just move yourself across the city. And we just haven't had um, uh, something that has emerged in that space yet. Um, uh, and I think when they when they do, that will be a renegotiation of, of, of what status is. If mm -hmm. you can get that time back, so yeah. um, I hear you, and I and I completely agree, and I, I don't think we're going to win this by forcing this down people's throats, but I certainly think that there are opportunities in the innovation uh, that will change the status perspective of this. Great, and um, so we've heard a lot about micro mobility, why it's important, what are the kind of different bottlenecks or potential challenges uh, as a technology it might face. Um, I'm wondering, we might want to move a little bit away from micromobility, so I can ask you a few a few more general questions. Yeah, sure. Um, one, so I, I know outside of micromobility, you have a range of kind of other tech interests uh, in the transport sector, but also I think you've done some work in kind of like decentralized finance. Uh, we, we talked about climate tech. Is there any other technology or kind of organization that you're particularly excited about that our audience might find useful to know about? Um, oh, this is a great question. Um, so I think um, there is an area of blockchain that has been completely, r relatively completely ignored uh, for the last little while. Uh, and that's because I think I think a lot of uh, crypto uh, is is largely hype. Um, and and mm -hmm. I say that with all love. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there is a there is uh, an emergence of a space called staked information markets, which I think um, will will really change uh, the, the the game. Um, the, there's a the, the kind of the primary um, uh, kind of example of this is a is a group called Numeri who are building a decentralized uh, hedge fund in the US. Um, but the but the kind of core idea behind it is that if someone approaches you uh, on the internet. Uh, and says, hey, I, I'm interested in being able to, um, you know, uh, tell you some information that I think is really valuable to you, but you need to pay me $50 for it. Um, 
you know, if I emailed you, I, I can guarantee you, you're probably going to go, who on earth is Oliver Bruce and how, you know, why on earth would I ever pay him $50? He's just approaching me randomly out of the internet. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, but you know, you, it, there's a time cost involved. It's like, oh, you could go and have a look at why I might know that information and you could look at my LinkedIn, but it would be very hard for you to be able to tell if I'd actually be good at that. Um, and I'd, and, and that would be $50 worth of value. Now, the alternative is I turn up and I say, hey, uh, Portrait, look, I've got this, uh, I've got I've got some information. I think it'll be really valuable to you. I have $500 staked as a, you know, sort of locked up on the internet that you can see and you can also destroy if I'm, if I'm you know, if I'm trying to effectively bre- breach your trust, take your money and run. Um, and I would also like you to pay me $50 for that information. All of a sudden, the economic incentives are really aligned. So it solves this problem that we have on the internet of there's no skin in the game for anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, anybody can p- leave a comment anywhere on the internet and it does our absolute heads in and I think is probably one of the biggest challenges. And when you look in the real world, you can't do that. You can't just, you know, randomly uh, turn up at a, at a, in parliament and start yelling. You have, to, you have to have done some work to be able to get into parliament in the first place. You, you can still yell, uh, but... Um, you know, you, you, there, there are there are means of of signaling that you have skin in the game and that you have an interest in what's going on here. Um, and I, I think that that model uh, is one that will really fix a lot of the the problems around being able to build trust between mm-hmm. uh, different people who exist uh, on the internet. Uh, that I don't think has. Uh, worked yet uh, but i think has the potential to emerge and so numerai is building a decentralized hedge fund because they want to surface information and recommendations around um you know what they should invest in uh where people can say hey i think you should invest in this and i think these you know you give us some data we'll we'll analyze it for you and come back and make a recommendation for you um uh and they're doing incredibly well they're probably, they're literally outperforming the entire market uh on a whole range of different things because they've worked out how to harness the wisdom of the crowd but in a way that everybody has skin in the game and um yeah that's just very novel i think yeah that's that sounds really interesting and i can see how it might even connect to kind of some emerging feel uh the emerging kind of tech around uh you know digital identification and having kind of persistent yeah digital identities yeah. that people can trust uh uh, one final kind of substantive question. So, uh, so you've done a lot of work, kind of looking at sort of innovation, focusing on innovation, and and you, you, uh, your business partner Horace has also done the same. What kind of would you say there are kind of sp- specific attributes or way of ways of thinking about things or kind of models that you hold in your head that help uh, people find kind of innovation and maybe specifically like disruptive innovation? What are, what are kind of good personality attributes or a good a ways to think about things that, that help you find these yeah. kind of gaps in the market. Totally. I mean, one of the, the most interesting books I, I think I ever read was a book called The Origin of Wealth. And it was written by Eric Beinhocker. And Eric is um, now the director of the Institute for New Economic Studies. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm familiar with yeah, it. INET. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and, and he wrote this book in 2006. And, and, and um, anybody who's read Sapiens uh, in the sort of more recent years about, you know, hey, look, everything's just a story. We're, we're, we're mimetic creatures and um, um, humans take cues from each other about how everything works. And we're really just trying to convince everybody, you know, it's, it's really a question of like, how do we most convincingly convince everybody else uh, that this is the, this is the truth? Um, uh, he used that uh, to, to be able to explain complexity economics. And that, that to me, um, complexity economics explains so much about the world. Uh, it's, a, it's about, you know, human beings over time have become more and more sophisticated and more and more complex in our organization. Um, and really the tools for that are about um, uh, our ability to take kind of physical technologies. So things like, hey, I know how to actually make steel and I know how to um, make thermoplastics or whatever it is, uh, and then combining it with the soft technology, so law and language and uh, cultural norms, etc. Um, and in that regard, um, I think you know the internet can be viewed in that regard as one kind of amazing thing where we've plugged ourselves into a global internet. Uh, kind of brain. Uh, there's a global brain that's available. Um, I think there's lots about it that's completely chaotic and not really good for us. Uh, and But I also think over time, we will build systems that actually allow us, similar to what I was mentioning with Numerai and the idea of staked information markets, where we can surface the really relevant and valuable uh, information uh, and the truth that like information, you know, tr- truth with a capital T uh, uh, to be able to uh, really kind of 
propel uh, society forward and become a really productive uh, group of, you know, that, that enable us to become really productive and be able to unlock our potential um, as, as, a, as a human race. Um, so, like, I'm net positive on the, on the especially on something like climate. I, I used to be very negative. I used to think yeah. we were really in trouble. Um, but something like micromobility, I think, is, a, is an example of uh, where innovation comes together uh, with uh, really just kind of going back to those nuts and bolts questions. Like, what is the job to be done? Uh, how, how can we actually service uh, the job to be done in a way that actually gets us out of a, something like a climate emergency? Because I think people until now have assumed that the world will continue to look exactly as it always has. Uh, it will just be an extrapolation. And I actually think that, um, you know, disruptive innovation frameworks like uh, the one that Clay also developed, we combine with things like complexity economics, really uh, can map us a world in which we, we end up uh, seeing uh, potential solutions and innovations that will really get us to the next level and, and, and solve these climate challenges that we face. Great. And uh, I, I've really enjoyed the conversation I've had with you. Uh, just one final question for people who are interested in learning more about micromobility or, uh, or maybe anything else you think is kind of important to know about. Uh, what kind of resources or people or organizations would you point them to? Yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, I'm obviously going to do a bit of a shout out for micromobility. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, micromobility.io, please come join us. We're going to be in Amsterdam uh, in June 1st and 2nd. Uh, we'll be in the US uh, in September um, and talking about these new vehicles and, and how they emerge. Um, but also as well, I mean, I, I think there are so many amazing thinkers on the internet. I really love the work that the Institute for New Economic Thinking does, INET. Um, and uh, I think, uh, yeah, anybody who's sort of dealing with complexity economics, uh, the Santa Fe Institute um, and, and folks like Bill Gurley and Josh Wolf, uh, who I think are, are kind of amazing investors uh, and thinking about the, 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 the world of investing from this lens, I think are, are really fascinating and well worth your time looking at. Great. So thank you again, Oliver, for sh sharing your time and knowledge with us. You've given us uh, a lot to think about and consider. And uh, thank you very much for your time to today, uh, our viewers. We look forward to seeing you at our next productivity talk. Uh, to get updated, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. I hope everyone stays safe, happy, and productive. Thanks. And Fantastic. And thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been an absolute joy to join you. And uh, right. yeah, I love, I didn't know much about the APO when I began, but uh, I do now and I, and I really love that it exists and uh, very, very happy to have contributed. Great. Thanks.